Grade 12s, welcome to our exam revision. I'm very excited to be here with you today because now it's the last little push that's left. You guys have written your prelims and now think about it. In a month or two, you're going to be finished with school, but now you just need to put this last little bit of hard work in. And I'm here today to help you and we're going to look at a few questions from last year, the 2012 prelim. So I really hope it's going to benefit you guys. So let's start. Let's get going. You can see that on the screen, we're talking about business ventures. This is our second learning outcome in business studies. And I made a quick little note here for you, what you need to know under this learning outcome. So let's have a quick look at this. It says, in this learning outcome, you need to know entrepreneurial qualities. You need to know your human rights, your inclusivity, your environmental issues, business information, investments, insurance, assurance, and forms of ownership. Now, I'm not going to go into detail with this. I'm not going to teach you about this again. And I really hope by now this all rings a bell because these are main chapters in your book that you need to know already. So this is purely a checklist for you guys. But let's start and fly away with our questions. Question one. I started off by putting a multiple choice question and then underline the correct word and match the columns. So it's basically a little bit out of the paper that covers your business ventures topics. So our first question reads as follows. Various options are provided as possible answers to the following questions. Choose the answer and write only the letter. Our first question says, a what is a circular representation where the information is divided into different categories and each segment represents a portion of 100%. I want to quickly show you guys, if I think of a circular representation, I automatically think about a circle and then it says the information is divided into different categories. So it could be something like that or whatever. I think this might be a pie chart because the minute that I see something that's round and something that's categorized into sections, I can think a pie chart because then they could color this little bit with something and they could make little dots here. So I know the answer is C, a pie chart. Let's carry on to my second question. Blue and Berry cell phone repair shop is A. Now we need to choose a form of ownership. But they give us a clue here. It says, and therefore has unlimited liability. Grade 12s, let's think back. What is unlimited liability? It says there is no limit to what I can lose in this partnership. Remember, I have put in capital, but now they're saying to me, unfortunately, there's no limit to what I can lose. If this business goes down, Unfortunately, I might lose my personal possessions and all the money that I've put into this business. So, which forms of ownership do we know have unlimited liability? There's only two of them. It's a sole trader and a partnership. The others, a CC, a private company and a public company, have limited liability. There's a limit to what we can lose. And that's a big benefit of a CC and a company. But now they're asking us, what form of ownership in these options have unlimited liability? Our answer is, as you can see, A, a partnership. As you can see, the other options didn't include anyone that has unlimited liability. So there was no sole trader in the rest of the answer. So we know that the answer was a partnership. Let's look at question 1.3. Choose the correct words from those given in brackets. The rate at which the Reserve Bank lends money to commercial banks is known as the prime or the repo rate. Now, let's quickly think about what that is. What is the prime rate? That has to do with lending out money to the public. It doesn't have to do with the Reserve Bank lending out money to commercial banks. So we know that it's called the repo rate. The answer is the repo rate because the 
prime lending rate is what we, us normal people, will go to a bank and lend money at. That's the prime rate. Question 1.4. Choose a description from column B that matches a term in column A. The JSE and entrepreneur. So let's have a look at the options that they give us here. Option A says takes calculated risks. Now that automatically sounds familiar to me, but let's read through all of them. Number B says South Africa's inflation rate is a steady 4.6%. Number C says serves as a link between the investors and entrepreneurs. Then question or option D says more organizations are looking for alternative solar power. So mm, that doesn't make sense to me for JSE or an entrepreneur. That first one still looks very familiar to me. Takes calculated risks. We know that an entrepreneur isn't afraid to take risks. So the answer for 1.4.2 entrepreneur is a. Now we need to go and look quickly. What is the JSE? We know that it doesn't have to do with inflation. We know that it doesn't have to do with solar power. So that leaves me with option C where it says it serves as a link between the investors. So my answer is C. Question number two. Now, this is quite a long answer, and we're going to discuss it a little bit, but let's read the question. It says, describe five ways in which a presenter should handle feedback and respond to questions after a presentation. Now, firstly, you need to see that this is for 10 marks. And I actually say describe five. So five times two gives me 10. So I need to have at least five full sentences for my 10 marks here. I can't just go and put 10 keywords down and think I'm going to get my 10 marks. You need to have five points that you are a full sentence describing something so you can get two marks per point. So we clear on that. Now let's look what they ask us here. They say, how does the presenter or how can he handle feedback about his presentation and how can he respond to questions? Now that could be the audience member asking him questions because often you'll have to have a question and answer session at the end of your presentation. So let's talk about the first one. Let's see how can this man handle feedback? Now feedback isn't always good. Feedback could be negative. But I would say, very importantly, the first point that we need to remember is you need to be optimistic. You need to be positive. Listen to what the person is trying to tell you and then only respond. That is very important because they're giving you feedback. You can't just jump in and say to him, no, this is not fair. I didn't do it. So listen and then respond. Now, let's think about feedback. I think it's very important that you stay calm. You do not become defensive. Stay calm and don't be defensive because what is this going to look like if you get feedback and now you are all aggressive? Stay calm and don't get aggressive. Now, the next little section says, how can I respond to questions? Now, very importantly, I'm going to say the same thing here. We said listen and then respond. You need to listen to the questions that they're asking you. You need to make sure that you understand that question. So firstly, I'm going to say to you, make sure that you write down the question and that you completely understand this question because otherwise you might fly away with an answer, but it's completely wrong and you're going to look like a real pauper. So make sure that you understand the question. Then you had to listen, you had to respond, but it's very important when you are answering someone's question that you don't just talk to that person. 
You must address the entire audience. You are answering to everyone. Yes, 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 this is my answer. You're not just looking at this poor person that just asked you the question because the rest of the audience is going to feel like they're not even talking to me. So address the entire audience. Talk to the entire audience. Now, we have four points already. Let's think about another one. If someone asks you a question, it's very important that you give him the utmost information that you can. But it's also important if you don't know the answer to a question that you're not going to lie. You're not going to stand in front of the audience and pre pretend that you know the answer. It's very important that if you do not know the answer, that you are going to be very clever and you're going to say, that is such a good question, John. Let's hear what the audience says about this question. So you're pulling the audience into this, but actually it's because you don't know the answer. So be creative when you have this situation. Be creative and involve your audience. That way, um, you can make them part of it, you can pull them into it, and they're going to enjoy it a lot more. Involve your audience. All right. I hope you guys understand that. And with the 10 marks here, they will accept other answers as well. This is definitely not the be all and end all. This was my opinion about it. There can be a whole page of different answers that they can accept here. But this was purely a guideline to what they can ask. Let's move on to question three. It says, read the case study below and answer the questions that follow. Now you'll see this person bought a house in 2011 at a market value of 400,000 Rand. Due to financial constraints, he decided to insure it for 300,000. Last month, his house was damaged in a fire during a community protest and the damages amounted to 100,000 rands. Now, when I read this case study, the first thing that should pop into my mind is that this man did not insure his house for the full value. You can see that he bought this house for 400,000, but due to the fact that he was having financial strain, it was hard for him he chose to only insure his house for 300,000. So automatically in my mind, I must think he is underinsured. He has not been paying enough to cover that full value, the 400,000. So let's see what the question is about. Let's see what they ask here. It says, the insurance company has decided to pay for damages that he incurred. Calculate the compens compensation that he will receive from this claim. Motivate why he will receive this amount. So we need to do a little calculation here. You need to put 300,000 over 400,000. And I'm going to explain to you why now. And we're going to times this by 100,000. Now, this is a simple calculation. This is a simple formula that you can use. We always use the top amount as the insured amount. I'm going to put a little I there for you guys so that you can remember that. And then at the bottom, I'm going to put an M that says this is my market value. This is what the item or the house or whatever you've insured is worth. And then this 100,000 is what the damage was. I'm going to say D in brackets there so you can remember this. So let's grab a calculator and do this calculation. We said it's 300,000 divided by 400,000. And then we said times 100,000. That gave me an answer of 75,000. Just quickly want to do that. 75,000 rands. So now this was the one section that they asked here. They asked us calculate 
how much this insurance company is going to pay out. Now we know that this person hasn't been paying what they should be paying. So they can't pay this guy 100,000. That would not be fair because remember, we cannot make a profit out of insurance. So they are only going to pay out 75,000 rands. Now let's see, we also need to motivate why this is happening. I want to see that you guys are writing there because this person is underinsured. They cannot pay out the full amount. Underinsured. Because we cannot make a profit out of insurance. Insurance says to us they will put us into the same position that we were before the loss occurred. So because he chose not to cover the whole value of his house, they choose not to pay out the 100,000. So I want to see under insurance there. I want to see he cannot make a profit out of insurance. And I also want to add here that he will be put back into the same position that he was before the loss happened. The same position before this loss happened. Because that is what insurance says. Insurance says you cannot make a profit. We will only give you what you had before this fire happened. Let's see what 3.2 asks. It says, explain to this man the principle of reinstatement and also why it is not applicable to his insurance claim. Now, Let's think a bit, when we did insurance, what does it mean? What was that principle of reinstatement? Firstly, I need to define this. I need to write here, reinstatement says that the insurance company has the right to replace or to rebuild my lost or damaged property. Now, they also say to me, and why is this not applicable in his claim? Because he is underinsured. I want to definitely see that answer here again. Because he is underinsured, they cannot give him what he had before this loss happened. They cannot pay out 100,000. They cannot rebuild his house for what it was worth because he hasn't been paying enough every month. So for four marks, you can talk about the fact that indemnification, I'm going to write this here for you as well. Indemnification says that you will not make a profit out of insurance. All right, indemnification. Wow, that's a long word, indemnification. And it's even spelled right. Indemnification says you will only be put into the same position that you were before this loss happened. You cannot be better off. Because remember when we did insurance, I explained to you guys that you get people out there that lie to insurance companies. If something happened, if they break into your house, now you say, oh yes, let's lie to the insurance and say that they stole the TV and the DVD recorder, but they didn't actually. So that is against the law. That is fraud. And that is why we say we cannot make a profit out of insurance. Insurance is there to put you back into the same position that you were before this loss happened. So. I hope you guys are clear on this. I think we should take a quick break and then we'll be right back. Great Tiles, welcome back. I hope you got something to drink and that you're ready for the next section here. We're going to start immediately with question four. Let's have a look what I'm asking. I'm saying explain the unemployment insurance fund under the following headings. The purpose of the UIF and also how contributions are made to this fund. So let's go back to this one, the purpose of UIF. I want to talk to you guys quickly. I want us to think back to what is UIF, unemployment insurance. So if for some reason 
you become unemployed, you have something to fall back on. You've got this insurance fund that's going to help you out, that's going to contribute for you to live while you are looking for another job. So for four marks, what am I going to write down here? Let's quickly think about it. UIF is there to protect you for in case you lose your job. Why would I lose my job? Because I was fired, because I'm having a baby, so I can go on maternity leave, because I adopted a child, or because I've been sick for a long time. So these are all things that I can write for my four marks. I'm gonna quickly write down a few points here for you. It is to ensure that you've got an income while you are unemployed. Why do I become unemployed? Because I was either fired, because I'm having a baby and I'm going on maternity leave. Remember when we did this, we spoke about adopting a child. So it's also for adoption. And then also if you are sick for a long time. Listen, this can't just be if you have flu for three days. This is when you're really sick and you are off work for longer than 21 days. Then you can only go and claim from UIF. You can't just go and claim if you're absent for two days from work. This has to be a serious case. So easily I can get my four marks in here. It covers me for in case I lose my job. Why would I lose my job? I can be fired, I can go on maternity leave, I can adopt or I can be sick. Just one more thing. Think back to when we did this again. I said to you, you cannot claim from UIF if you decide that you are going to stop working. If you quit your job, if you've had enough of this, you decide you're going to go and play golf for three months, you cannot claim from UIF because they will turn around and they'll say to you, but you had a job. You chose not to work anymore, so we're not going to pay for you to sit at home and do nothing. So please remember that you cannot claim from UIF if you decide to leave your job. The next section of this question I said, how are contributions made to this fund? Now, there's a 2% contribution that happens. And how is this 2% contributed? The employer contributes 1% and the employee contributes 1% of the total of their salary. So let's have a look. I'm gonna make a quick note for you guys here. There's a 2% contribution of which 1% is contributed by the employer and another 1% is contributed by the employee, giving you your 2% contribution. There we go. That was question four. Let's have a look at my next question. We're going to talk a little bit about forms of ownership now. And I love forms of ownership because it's so interesting and it's really so straightforward. If you know your characteristics of your sole trader partnership, CC, private and public company, these questions are a breeze and they tend to always be asked in the same way. So it's really not hectic, it's not that bad. Let's have a look at what I've asked here. I say, discuss how the following factors will have an effect on the success and or failure of a company. Look at that, that is very important, grade 12s. I am asking you to talk about a company. Now, I would make a little note here for myself. Remember that a company can either be a public company or it can be a private company. And in other words, we can talk about both of those because they didn't specify. They didn't say to me, discuss a public company or specifically a private company. They are just saying, discuss in terms of companies. Now, the first thing they want us to talk about is capital. Capital means money. Where do they get their money from? Who can think? If you've got a public company, you are allowed to sell shares to the public. 
public company. Think about it. They sell shares to the public on the JSE. So I can get capital from there. I can say, I want to expand my business. I want to go build a new wing or a new section in my business. Where am I going to get the money from? I can decide to go and sell 100 more shares on the JSE. People are going to invest. They're going to give me their capital. And I can go and expand or build something new or get a new product or whatever. So is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think we could say it could lead to the success of a company because now we've got more funds coming in. We've got that benefit of saying, let me just put some more shares out there and I can get some more capital in. But it can also lead to the failure because what if I make this choice hesitant on, oh, I'm just going to quickly put on 100 shares and then I can't pay them back. I can't pay them dividends. What's going to happen? The public is going to be very unhappy. They're going to say, hmm, no, I'm going to sell my shares because this company isn't doing well. They're not even paying me dividends. And then what's going to happen? We've now expanded our company and people are withdrawing their money. This can lead to the total failure of our company. Let's think about it now. If you've got a sole trader, you've got one owner. You've got one person that can contribute capital. So your capital is very limited. Where if you've got a partnership, uh, uh, sorry, a public company or a private company, you can have a lot more people involved. Quickly tell me, I'm going to write it for you here in brackets. How many people can be in a public company? It is seven or more. And then how many people can be in a private company is minimum one to maximum 50. So that is a way lot more than you can have as a sole trader or a partnership. Remember, with a sole trader, you one person. You can only contribute so much money. And a partnership, you two people, maximum 20. So you also have limited funds. Now this for a company can lead to the success because you've got more owners, more shareholders, you've got more capital coming in. At last today, I have got an essay question. I thought it's time for us to put this in. In previous lessons, you've asked me about it and I've said, we will do it, I promise. So today is the day we're gonna talk about an essay question. So breathe, relax, get your notes ready and here we go. I said, James and Ntokoza run a successful partnership at Mpangeni, known as JN, look at this very important one, JN Partners. They want to increase their wealth and capital by investing some of their business income they have generated over the past five years. Now let's see what they are asking. They're saying, as a financial advisor of j and &E Partners, evaluate the different factors that must be considered when making informed investment decisions. Also, explain five types of investment opportunities, five types, and elaborate on the risk factors. So I'm going to underline that as well for each of these. Now, I know that you often freak out for essay questions. They tell you exactly what to do. You can see very clearly that they're asking here for your factors that you need to take into consideration. They're asking you to discuss five investment types and they're asking us to talk about those five investments risk factors. Easy, easy. The first thing that we need to remember when we're doing an essay is that you must have an introduction. Now, I've put a little memo on here because it's so much writing. So please, I'm sorry if it's a little bit small for you to read, but I'm going to talk about it as we go through it. Just going to make it a bit easier so I can chat to you and not write the whole time. The first thing that I want to do is I want to write an introduction. I will underline it here for you. An introduction, we need to talk about the question, we need to say, this is what is required of me. 
So I've said to you guys here, remember we need to talk about the factors, we need to talk about five types of investments, and we need to talk about the risk. So let's see what I said in my introduction. I say, investors have a range of investment options to choose from. They must ensure or they must measure these investment opportunities against the criteria for good investment. Investors set financial goals and consider different factors when they make their decisions. Also, obviously, whatever you choose to talk about is fine. But look at this. I'm saying that only a maximum of three marks will be allocated for your introduction. So grade 12s, do not go and overwrite the story. Do not go and write half a A4 page for your introduction. It's gonna waste your time. Have two sentences, three sentences, and you carry on. You start with your actual body of your report or your essay. Now, let's have a look here. The first thing that we're gonna discuss is the factors that we have to consider when we want to invest. I've got the factors here. You guys will remember from your work, if you scroll down and have a look here with me, there are nine factors that I need to take into consideration. We are gonna discuss each one of them. The first one is return on investment. Now, listen to the name, return on your investment. What are you going to get back? This could be interest, this could be dividends, and this is what is important to me. As an investor, I want to know that I'm going to get something back for the money that I've put into it. So it has to be good. And look at this. It says this return should be expressed as a net after-tax return. We need to have a look at the net after-tax return. This should be higher than the inflation rate. What is the inflation rate? Inflation rate says, we can have a look, there's always a trend happening where it says, when inflation goes up, it means that the prices are going up of goods, but my buying power is getting less. So what they're saying here is, it's very important that my investment must beat inflation, because otherwise my money is going to be worthless. I can't even buy anything with it. So why am I going to invest in it? Our next factor that we're going to talk about is the risk. Now they're saying here, the higher the risk, the better your chance of earning something, of getting a return, of getting a high return. And the lower the risk, the less of a risk you take, the safer option, you probably won't make so much. But this depends on the person because you will get people that, oh, we're not scared, I'm gonna invest everything. You're willing to take a high risk. But then you get people that are really scared and gonna say, mm, no, I think I'm gonna be safe, I'm gonna take a low risk investment. So let's have a look. I want to quickly underline there for you, we need to talk about risk. Our next one that we talk about is liquidity. Now. I underlined here, I said the term liquidity is used to describe the ease and the speed with which you can convert an investment into cash. Now, for something to be liquid, it means how quick can I get rid of this and get cash in my pocket? Think about something like a house. Is it easy to sell a house? Can your parents just decide, you know what, I need 500,000 Rand, so I'm quickly gonna sell my house tonight. Yeah, you can decide you're gonna sell your house, but no one's gonna come tonight and buy it. Oh, they might, but it's probably not gonna happen that way. It's gonna take a while. You need to market this house, you need to get agents in, so it's not very liquid. We can't convert this property into cash overnight. Where if you think about a savings account, if you have a savings account, you can go to an ATM, put your card in, and you're gonna get your cash, uh, your cash right there and then. So it's easy to get my money out, to get that investment turned into cash. Let's carry on. I also have taxation. This is a factor that I need to look at because remember, every single investment that you have will be taxed. It says, a good investment will have good 
after tax returns. Because we are forced to pay tax, we still want to get a good return after that. Income tax implications must be considered because remember, there are different values, different tax rates will be paid on our different investments. The next topic that I need to talk about, we've spoken about it, we just touched it, is inflation rate. Now, we said inflation rate refers to a decrease in the value of your money with prices that rise of the products. So in other words, it boils down to you can afford less. You are paying more and more and more, but you're not getting a higher salary. Have you heard when your mom or dad goes to the shop and they say, when I have 300 Rand, I only get one little bag. Where's my money going to? Where last year, if you had 300 Rand, you might have got two little bags, that's checkers. Now, that is inflation. It means everything is becoming more expensive, but my employer is not upping my salary every time that the inflation rate goes up. It's quite a bummer. I think they should do that. Inflation says people are highly affected by a high inflation rate because if prices increase, they can buy less with their money because your power decreases. Income from an investment should be higher than the inflation rate. So we said that just now. Make sure that it's going to beat inflation Inflation has a positive effect on some investments such as property and shares because it will beat it. It will grow with it. Okay, now let's have a look at my next factor, investment period. Now, this is how long you are willing to invest your money for. Some people might have years and years and years if you just finish school and you get your first job and you are now going to start saving for your retirement, you've got years to do this. But then some people only have five years or two years because for some reason they might have lost their money or they didn't plan for their future and now they've only got a very short time to go and invest. So the longer that you've got to invest, the safer it is for you. You can then spread around all your investments, a little bit in high risk, a little bit in low risk, because you've got time. You've got time to make your money. If you only have a short time to make your money, this isn't so nice for you because you probably will have to take high risk investments out to make your money, such as shares. You're gonna have to gamble a little bit with this money and very high risk, you might lose everything, which is very concerning, especially if you've only got two years against or to save for. My next one says investment planning factors. Investors must consider the safest possible investment. Some opportunities offer low income, but it could be safer. Now, if you are willing to take a risk, you know that your chance is better of making money quick. So this is a personal thing. You can say, yes, I am not interested in making an income. I have 20 years, so it's okay. I'm, I'm very chill. My money can grow over a long time. But they're saying here, examine opportunities with a history you need to go and make sure. Look into your different investment opportunities. Guys, this point is so important. Divide your investment between different opportunities. We call this diversification. For you to have a diverse investment portfolio, it means that you are not putting all of your eggs into one basket. I'm not putting all of my money in shares or all of my money into a house. I'm putting a little bit in shares, I'm putting a little bit in a house, putting a little bit in my bank account. For in case something happens to one of them, I know that I've still got the backup of the other two. Do you get it? Cool, let's carry on. Now, we also need to talk about budgets. A budget is drawn up to see if you have surplus money that you can invest. 
It's all very nice and dandy if you decide that you're going to invest, but you can't afford it. So budgets can be short term, medium term or long term. But remember that you need to look out for your unforeseen costs. What is an unforeseen cost? If today you get home and your kitchen floor is underwater because your washing machine is leaking, oh, now you need to get out someone, they need to come and repair this. That is an unforeseen cost. And now if you've invested all of your extra money, how are you gonna pay for your washing machine? How are you gonna have it fixed? So you need to ensure in this budget that you can afford to invest and that you've also got your other reserves, your extra money that you've got available for if something happens. You must have that backup system. Our last factor that we need to talk about is volatility. Oh, that is a hectic word. What does it mean for something to be volatile? Volatile means explosive, like a volcano. Now, if we look at it, markets can be volatile. Markets can go very well, and then the next day it can go bad. Even a few hours later, something can go wrong, and then it drops and you lose all of your money. So we're saying here that fluctuations, this means when there's differences in national and international economic trends, will have an impact on the markets. The level of volatility will determine my amounts of returns. Now we've covered the one thing. We had an introduction. We spoke about our factors we need to consider. The next thing they asked of us is to have five investment types. Now you'll see I have put in a lot of different answers here that you can discuss. I'm going to briefly go through them because we did all of this when we did investments but I'm going to go through and quickly explain to you what you can do. Now quickly listen to me grade 12s. If they ask you for five you only do five. It doesn't happen or, or help if you think you're going to be clever now and do ten because they're gonna stop marking it. They very clearly say only the first five will be marked. So you're wasting your time. Don't do that. If they ask you for five, stick to five. So let's have a look here how this is set out. I've got all my different types, starting with unit trusts. Then I also added in the risk factor because remember they require this in the question. They said to us, discuss the risk factor. Let's have a look at unit trusts. Unit trust says, we can now buy, it's almost like buying shares in different little companies. But I go to a company and I buy a unit trust. There's a trust or a fund manager that's going to manage this on my behalf. I'm not involved in that. And then, at the end of a certain time, I will get a return, I will get interest on my capital that I've put into this. What is the risk here? It is low to medium. That is all you have to do. You don't have to go into great detail because they ask for five and it's basically six marks per category that you're going to discuss which gives us 30 marks already. That's like almost your entire long question. But don't overwrite it. Don't go take unnecessary chances and discuss 10 because you're not going to finish your paper. You're wasting your time. Let's have a look at the next one. The next one I discussed is managed portfolio. It says a financial institution or financial advisor invests your money in different investments such as shares and he manages them over a period of time. If it does not perform well, the portfolio may be restructured. Now, this I personally wouldn't use in an answer because it's not telling me what investment type they asked me for five types of investments. This is basically saying that you can have a broker. You can have someone that's going to invest on your behalf. But it's not really telling me what type of investment it's going to go in. 
So I wouldn't add that in. It was on the memo, so they did accept this, but be careful of doing that. Rather stick to your actual investment choices, of which the next one is totally acceptable, and this is endowment policies. Now, endowment policy says, this is for a longer period of time, usually for more than five years. The risk is low to medium as a forecast is made, which is not always accurate. And high unrealistic expectations of the investor is created. Now it says here on the maturity date, the investor could receive less than the original capital. How does this work, grade 12s? You invest something, and then when it pays out, you get less money back. How is that possible? Because of inflation. If your investment type or class does not keep up with inflation, it's eating and eating and eating and eating away at your investments, and in 10 years time, when that endowment pays out, you're gonna think, I was wasting my time. I was wasting my money. So you need to be very aware of the inflation rate. Once again, you guys can see, we keep talking about the inflation rate. Our next type is a fixed deposit. Now this is a very popular one. It's a very safe option. A fixed deposit says, I put my money into this account for a fixed period of time. I can get my money back, but I usually need to give them, if you have a look here, I didn't include it in there, but I need to give them a notice period. If I want to withdraw my money before that period is over. But you'll see it's a very low risk factor. Your money is safe. It's there in the bank. Someone's looking after it for you. Then I want to skip here to bonds. A bond is something that I need to buy a house or to buy a building. Now they're saying here, this is for big capital projects such as buildings where our rate of return is normally above average. Rate of return meaning your interest that you're gonna be, get back. They're saying that it's usually above average. So it's a very good investment choice. The risk factor is high though. So this is not for my person that's scared. This is not for the person that only has a year to invest because what if they lose everything? Let's have a look. It's high because some buildings could be overvalued and may not generate the required return when it is resold. So be very careful with that one. Make sure you remember it's a high risk. Now, property itself, I would definitely use property. Property can keep up with inflation. As you hear, we've been talking about inflation a lot. Um, the only drawback with property is that the location can have a big influence on this. Let's say you buy a house and 10 years later, this area is so full of crime and the houses have gone down now you want to resell and you're probably not going to make a profit off it because the location is so bad. That's why they're saying it could be high depending on the location. If you buy in an area that you know is really established, everything is going well there, it won't be a high risk. It will be a low to a moderate risk. So grade 12s, make sure that you explain this risk in the correct way. Let's have a look at the next one. Our retirement annuity, an RA, remember they can ask you what is an RA? It's a retirement annuity. This is something that we take out, we pay a monthly premium for it, and it's over a long period of time before we retire. Now, this is definitely low risk. Definitely. If you start contributing when you are 30 years old and you pay every single month, then at the end, when you're 65, you're gonna get a big lump sum of money that's going to pay out. You will be taxed on it though, but it's safe. It's being looked after, nothing's gonna to happen to your money. So it's a good investment opportunity or good category. 
offshore investments. This means when you are investing your money outside of the country, into a foreign country, a different country. So we need to be careful of this because it can be high risk. It can be a bit of a dangerous situation because we don't always know what's happening in those countries. What if their economy crashes? I'm gonna lose all my money. So I need to make sure that I've also got some investments in South Africa, that I know that I've got a little backup to come back to for in case something happens with this. So once again, it could be high risk because of the performance of that country. If we know the country's doing well, if it's a stable economy, then it will only be a low to medium risk. I also added in here life assurance because that can also be an investment. If I invest into this policy every single month, it will pay out if something happens. In other words, if I die, but my beneficiary, my wife, my husband, my kids, whoever I leave that money to, they will benefit at the end. So it is definitely low risk because a fixed amount is guaranteed for the day that I pass away. Debentures. We did this in detail when we spoke about investments. Debentures. Quickly think, what was the difference between a debenture and a share? Both is traded on the JSE. Both is sold by a public company. But remember with your debenture, your income, that interest income is guaranteed. They have to, at the end of that period, repay you that interest that you have earned. Where if you have shares and the company isn't doing too well, they can choose not to declare dividends. Remember, a dividend is your return on your share. So there's a big difference between them. Investments in a business. This is also an option, guys. It says when you start your own business or you invest into an existing business. Now, once again, this can be low, but also high. If you start your own business, it can be high risk because you might lose all your money. But if you are buying into a well-established business, you know this business, you know they're doing well, it can be low risk. Um, I added here Stockfell, which my kids also love answering, and it's definitely acceptable because this is a structured body of investors that you can go and invest your money in. Once in a month or in a week or however your Stockfell works, it's your turn to get that amount of money that's coming your way. And I think it's low risk, except if you do not know this establishment. You need to be careful of that because they might disappear with your money. The last thing, grade 12s, that we need to include is a conclusion. A conclusion is just as important as your introduction. So you need to conclude. You need to now say, after doing this essay, this is what I have found. So let's see what I said. After considering your various opportunities and your risks, the partners can then make a calculated decision. Only two marks will be allocated for your conclusion. So once again, don't go write half a page. You are absolutely wasting your time. They'll never allocate 10 marks for an introduction or a conclusion. You write one or two sentences. You can even go so far to say, after looking at these investment types, I think they should invest in property. You can make your suggestion if you want to. And that is the end of our essay. Great 12s, I really hope that you are gonna work hard for your exams, that you're gonna go and study and prepare well, and that it really, really goes well with each and every one of you. And thank you so much for tuning into our show. Bye bye. But let's read through all of them. Number B says South Africa's inflation rate 
is a steady 4.6%. Number C says, serves as a link between the investors and entrepreneurs. Then question or option D says, more organizations are looking for alternative solar power. So mm, that doesn't make sense to me for JSE or an entrepreneur. That first one still looks very familiar to me. Takes calculated risks. We know that an entrepreneur isn't afraid to take risks. So the answer for 1.4.2 entrepreneur is A. Now we need to go and look quickly. What is the JSE? We know that it doesn't have to do with inflation. We know that it doesn't have to do with solar power. So that leaves me with option C where it says it serves as a link between the investors. So my answer is C. Question number two. Now this is quite a long answer and we're going to discuss it a little bit, but let's read the question. It says, describe five ways in which a presenter should handle feedback and Grade 12s, welcome to our exam revision. I'm very excited to be here with you today because now it's the last little push that's left. You guys have written your prelims and now think about it. In a month or two, you're going to be finished with school, but now you just need to put this last little bit of hard work in. And I'm here today to help you and we're going to look at a few questions from last year, the 2012 prelim. So I really hope it's going to benefit you guys. So let's start. Let's get going. You can see that on the screen, we're talking about business ventures. This is our second learning outcome in business studies. And I made a quick little note here for you, what you need to know under this learning outcome. So let's have a quick look at this. It says, in this learning outcome, you need to know entrepreneurial qualities. You need to know your human rights, your inclusivity, your environmental issues, business information, investments, insurance, assurance, and forms of ownership. Now, I'm not gonna go into detail with this. I'm not gonna teach you about this again. And I really hope by now, this all rings a bell because these are main chapters in your book that you need to know already. So this is purely a checklist for you guys, but let's start and fly away with our questions. Question one. I started off by putting a multiple choice question and then underline the correct word and match the columns. So it's basically a little bit out of the paper that covers your business ventures topics. So our first question reads as follows. Various options are provided as possible answers to the following questions. Choose the answer and write only the letter. Our first question says, a what is a circular representation where the information is divided into different categories and each segment represents a portion of 100%. I want to quickly show you guys, if I think of a circular representation, I automatically think about a circle and then it says the information is divided into different categories. So it could be something like that or whatever. I think this might be a pie chart because the minute that I see something that's round and something that's categorized into sections, I can think a pie chart because then they could color this little bit with something and they could make little dots here. So I know the answer. As you can see, the other options didn't include anyone that has unlimited liability. So there was no sole trader in the rest of the answer. So we know that the answer was a partnership. Let's look at question 1.3. Choose the correct words from those given in brackets. The rate at which the Reserve Bank lends money to commercial banks is known as the prime or the repo rate. Now, let's quickly think about what that is. What is the prime rate? That has to do with lending out money to the public. It 
doesn't have to do with the reserve bank lending out money to commercial banks. So we know that it's called the repo rate. The answer is the repo rate because the prime lending rate is what we, us normal people, will go to a bank and lend money at. That's the prime rate. Question 1.4. Choose a description from column B that matches a term in column A. The JSE and entrepreneur. So let's have a look at the options that they give us here. Option A says takes calculated risks. Now that automatically sounds familiar to me. Is C a pie chart? Let's carry on to my second question. Blue and Berry cell phone repair shop is A. Now we need to choose a form of ownership. But they give us a clue here. It says and therefore has unlimited liability. Great 12s, let's think back. What is unlimited liability? It says there is no limit to what I can lose in this partnership. Remember, I have put in capital, but now they're saying to me, unfortunately, there's no limit to what I can lose. If this business goes down, unfortunately, I might lose my personal possessions and all the money that I've put into this business. So, which forms of ownership do we know have unlimited liability? There's only two of them. It's a sole trader and a partnership. The others, a CC, a private company and a public company, have limited liability. There's a limit to what we can lose. And that's a big benefit of a CC and a company. But now they're asking us, what form of ownership in these options have unlimited liability? Our answer is, as you can see, A, a partnership. 